So thank you for joining and um, uh, thank you for your interest in advance and um, I hope I can tell you some things today which uh, you can put a bit of a value from. So my name is Cornelius and um, I have the pleasure today to talk to you about um, open source multi-factor authentication and what we have done in the past 10 years. So, um, yeah, I was born a couple of years ago and actually um, how was my way to come to the computers? Uh, in 87, I played my first uh, Bach Sonata and as a reward, I received my first computer, as you can see. And um, then I studied physics and it might be a, also a very interesting aspect because um, studying physics means you are meant to understand things and you are meant to uh, question things and so even during, uh, during the starting, uh, during the studying, I also started uh, with Linux because it was great. It was like some um, natural laws. You could inspect the system, you could understand it. So it was really great and um, then actually I immediately also started working in the IT and in 2004 I started working with a lot of starts yes I started working with uh, two-factor authentication and you may say wait 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 2004 hmm smartphones didn't even exist back then so what what did he do then yeah and actually um, the first two-factor authentication I personally was involved with was uh, smart cards. So really, uh, PKIs, certificate authorities, enrolling X509 certificates, all this nasty stuff. So um, for me, two-factor authentication is not only having an app on your smartphone. Yeah, two-factor authentication and then open source. So, um, yeah, as, as you might realize, I'm, I'm actually, I, I, I missed this or I skipped this. I'm actually from Germany and it is my first time here at scale. And um, I spent the last uh, two days in the exhibition hall and it was very interesting. And I think it's a good idea to, to recap what open source actually is or where open source actually comes from. And uh, my understanding is, or some people say that in the uh, 1950s, 1960s, actually um, there were, was the need for about three computers in the world. And so computers were sold as big, big machines and then, well, hmm, we have to run computers in some certain way. Okay, okay, we also need to ship some software. But actually the software was shipped as source code or as human readable code because why shouldn't you there's only this one big computer and here's the software to run it yeah this changed maybe 15 20 years later then the first software only companies appeared uh, I actually was impressed myself Microsoft was founded in 1975 and um, so this is actually a kind of change in the history where uh, companies came up who had to run a business model um, based on software. So they needed to uh, produce revenue by selling the software. And so, hmm, why should we provide the source code? So the software was shipped as closed source. However, um, not all people like this and um, in 83 Richard Stallman founded the GNU project and this is where we have this great software license the GPL then coming from yeah but why would someone found the GNU project why would someone uh, want to do open source remember I'm a uh, uh, I, I studied physics because 
Why would someone do open source? Because you do not like black boxes, because you want to understand things. And uh, technicians want to fix bugs. They want to, s uh, to work together. They want to solve problems quicker at a lower cost. And um, this is why the need, in my understanding, for open source um, still existed. And looking a bit further, there's also another thing, why, sh why should someone produce software? Why should someone um, write code if he's not a software company? And the thing is, open source is often about scratching your own itch. Yeah, but I think um, there might be problems this is something you could discuss. There might be problems where actually no open source solution exists for. Um, why might this be? Um, maybe there's no personal itch to scratch. Or maybe the itch you will have to scratch is too big and um, me sitting in the basement and writing some uh, source code which I actually want to have, um, I am not enough to, to, uh, to write a, a big project what solves the big problem. Um, and then there's this interesting GNU concept of, hmm, your sh software shouldn't solve all problems, yeah, but uh, the, the, the GNU concept is do one thing and um, do it right. And yeah, maybe sometimes this might be a bit misleading because uh, there might only be small solutions for small itches in the open source environment. I know this is a, a hefty claim, but yeah. Yeah, and if you take, uh, take a look at two-factor authentication and open source, or um, then you will find that there is a module for the free radius server. And it's basically there since FreeRadius version 1 in the year 2004, again, before smartphones. It's um, an OTP module so that the FreeRadius server would be able to um, handle one-time passwords. But this is only a small itch because it will only handle problems you can solve with the FreeRadius server. So you can... Um, uh, do two-factor authentication if you have some, some radius setup, but nowhere else. Then, um, I don't know the year exactly, <clears throat> it must be after 2010, you have the Google Authenticator lip pump. Maybe you stumbled upon it because it's a cool thing to uh, secure your uh, local Linux machine, Add it to the PAM stack, and boom, you can do, do uh, OTP authentication at your Linux machine. But again, you can only do um, the OTP authentication at this single Linux machine. Again, it's only a small itch you can scratch here. And then um, my most interesting uh, software project, WordPress. Um, if you look in the WordPress uh, plugin store, whatever it's called, you find about 150 plugins that have something to do with one-time passwords. Again, these plugins, it's, it's great that they all implemented these plugins, but they will only solve problems you have with WordPress. And here you already see, imagine you, you want to secure your WordPress uh, login, and imagine you want to secure your uh, uh, VPN login with Radius, then you would need the RLM OTP for free Radius, and you would need one of the 150 WordPress plugins. <coughs> yeah, then a small technical detour. Um, in 2000 seven, the iPhone came on the market. And before this, actually, what kind of second factors did we have? Yes, we had the smart cards, but we also had these key fob tokens, um, 
the RSA Secure ID tokens are much older. Then we had a lot of vendors who also um, pushed to the market key fob tokens based on the RFC, which is described in the uh, or based on HOTP, which is described in the RFC. So, again, just with, like with the computers at the start, you had hardware vendors who provided hardware and so that the hardware would be able to run the key fob tokens hardware, they provided software. But again, unfortunately, as closed source proprietary software. Okay, I know I also worked with these management tools, and there are great software out there, but unfortunately, they were all closed source. Um, as I said, in 2004, the RFC was defined, so this was, I think, an important step because the hardware vendors created a hardware that was standardized. And it was also an important step um, so that later Google could collect all the pieces and um, publish the, the Google Authenticator based on the initially HOTP algorithm, later on the TOTP algorithm, and some QR code stuff they found somewhere, I think, in Japan. But still, yeah, you have the Google Authenticator LIPPAM module, but still you have no way to manage in a bigger way the aspect of multi-factor authentication in a flexible way, in a bigger way. And um, this is why or when we came up with the Privacy Idea Project. It is an authentication and a management system. We started the project in 2014. And what's in it? So <coughs> the, the initial um, implementation contained the HOTP and the TOTP algorithm. Luckily, they were defined in the RFCs. Luckily, there was hardware. To the, there were hardware tokens around that could be used, and also the first authenticator apps. And why did we do this? Um, we wanted to provide an, a working alternative to big players out there. And we wanted to give the, the possibilities and freedom to, to the users. And um, to, yeah, maybe to avoid a hostile takeover, we also chose the AGPL license so that, um, yeah, so the, you know the AGPL license, um, in addition to GPL, also claims, hey, if you are using the software to provide a service and you modify the software, you still have to publish the modifications. Um, and although this was a bigger itch to, to, to provide a management system, um, this was still started by only a few or only me and um, the idea behind it was okay so um, this has to be open source because this is something the world needs and um, okay maybe we can make a living by providing consulting and support and this was also always the vision, so to, to provide a, an, an, a lasting open source authentication system to the world. Um, I won't shortly explain what I understand under management system. <coughs> um, managing in contrast, for example, to the mentioned uh, LIPAM module, um, managing would mean I have thousands of user objects and I have thousands of authentication objects, thousands of uh, second factors. And what in detail would I then do with managing? Um, this means 
say, hey, uh, actually, I'm an IT guy. I am lazy, so I want to automate processes. I don't need only a, a system that does um, high security algorithms and cryptography. I want a system that um, takes a burden from the administrator, that makes the administrator life easy, that automates things. Um, a system that controls the life cycle of an authentication token. So one day the, the second factor gets generated, then it gets lost or the user leaves the company. And this also has to be uh, possible to, um, to control with such a management system. Also, um, <laughs> I was once asked, hey, you are building, a, a, um, you are building an, a, a Linux service. Why are you doing a web UI? Why can't I configure the system with a configuration file? Yeah, this is obviously obvious. A configuration file can be configured by one person, but we need to distinguish different roles. Yeah, we have administrators who define the uh, the way the, the system works, we have uh, help desk users who only have limited rights on the tokens. We have users themselves who maybe um, are allowed to manage their own tokens. <coughs> okay, this is the managing part. And what is actually the authentication part? <coughs> the idea here is to have a system that is not strictly bound to any application. Take the free radius plugin. This only works with free radius, so you will only be able to um, provide second factor authentication to radius protocol based applications. Take any web application, WordPress or any other application. You can use this second factor then in this application, but not in other applications. So for us, as an authentication system, it was important to, um, yeah, to decouple this protocol uh, from the authentication. Um, and this is why Privacy Idea provides a REST API um, to allow a generic way of authenticating <coughs> And then we have plugins so that an application like Free Radius, an application like, um, like an, any IDP, can communicate to Privacy Idea. This way, I can achieve that all tokens are centrally managed, and um, I can authenticate systems with basically all authentication protocols. Yeah, um, as a bad picture or as a simple picture, it looks like this. Um, down in the left corner, you would have the Privacy idea server. Um, it would read users from a certain user source. And in the upper part, you have all the applications. You have a VPN, you have a key cloak, you have a free radius server. And these connect via these green boxes are actually the plugins. These connect via plugins and the REST API to Privacy IDEA. And this way you see if we ever want to add another authentication protocol or if we want to add another application, we simply have to write a plugin for this. Yeah, and I personally think that you could argue a lot about, hey, what is the best authentication mechanism? Is a smart card better than a smartphone app? Is the a FIDO2 token better than uh, whatever? Is a, a TOTP app better as a, as than an SMS? But in, in bigger scenarios, this is often not a, the question because in what we see in bigger scenarios, the problem often arises from the workflow. And uh, so I often say that secure authentication is a matter of smooth workflows. Because as I said, in my opinion, there's not the, the best second factor. The one factor that works for in, in one scenario is not suitable in the other scenario. 
and this is why privacy idea uh, supports a vast variety of different uh, second factors. Um, something you might know like TOTP or WebAuthn, but also some um, more virtual things like a registration token or a ton list, which is actually, actually a, a scratch list. You may wonder, why would someone want to print a list of passwords on a paper? I wonder too, but there are side effects, there are certain scenarios where in, in, in this special case, the administrator is happy that he can do this. I now want to give you a technical overview over the system. And um, so what is it? Looking at the stack, starting at the bottom, um, data is stored in a SQL database. Um, as we use Python, we are using SQL Alchemy to, um, to have an abstraction layer. This is basically a web application. So above this, you are running a web server, an Apache or an Nginx. And within this web, th web server, you have the Python application, um, which facil facilitates Flask to provide the REST API. And on top of it, we have a single page application that consumes the REST API. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is, if you want to automate things, you can actually uh, go in at each level you want to. You, for example, if you have your own um, user portal and you would say, hey, I only want to add the list of the tokens of a user to this user portal, you could use the REST API to request the tokens of the user. If you want to automate things on the system itself, you could directly go on the library level, on the privacy idea Python libraries to automate stuff. And of course, you can also access the database. Because looking at the deployment, privacy idea is open source. And what I realized in the last two days, mm, we have to explain that privacy idea is open source. So you can go to GitHub, you can go to the Python package index, you can download it and you can install it. And this is also the thing, you can install it via the Python package index, via pip install, we have Debian packages in the repository so that you can easily install it on an Ubuntu LTS system. Yeah, under certain conditions, we also have RPM packages. Um, then you can think about, hey, how do you actually want to de deploy your authentication system for multi-factor authentication? Um, you can do this. Often it's a good idea to use a redundant database. And then you can also have node-specific configuration, which means imagine you are setting up a system of three or four nodes, and one of the nodes may be located in the DMZ. And of course, on this node, you do not want to, uh, administrators to log in, and maybe you only restrict this to the self-service portal for the users, while the login for the administrators is only possible somewhere in the back end. Um, an important thing is where the users actually come from. For this, we have uh, resolvers and realms, and we can fetch users from different uh, user sources because we don't want to do user management. Yes, you probably already have a user management. Um, users might be located in LDAP, in your Active Directory, in flat files, in a SQL database, wherever. And we use these resolver concepts to fetch these users from these user sources, and then we can combine different sources to certain realms. And this way we um, also can manage a kind of, um, yeah, we can distinguish certain user groups, certain, um, certain customers, if you, for example, provide this as a service for someone else. And um, yeah, these are then the realms. What can we do with tokens, with the second factors? Um, 
as I already mentioned, administrators, help desk users, operators, users themselves can assign tokens, they can delete them, they can manage whatever you want to. And the interesting thing is, these tokens then are centrally managed, but, so you would say, hey, great, uh, the user has five applications where he can log in, but he has only one token. That's basically right, but the user could also have 10 tokens. Maybe he needs two TOTP tokens on his smartphone and he has three UV keys at his keychain and so on. So it is, of course, possible to assign many different tokens to a user. Um, from a development perspective, <coughs> Uh, the token types are implemented as Python classes so that we can easily add new token types as we go. The latest token type I think we implemented a couple of months ago is was actually kind of day password token, which is a bit derived from a TOTP token. Uh, again, you may wonder, hey, what, what kind of nonsense is this but hey other people other ideas yeah so and for example the day password token is a token type that displays a one-time password uh, well not really a one-time password but a code that is valid for four hours for six hours for 24 hours and which can be used and used again in these time frame. Then the probably most important thing in privacy idea is policies because this is the way how you configure the behavior of privacy idea. Um, for this we have defined scopes where the policy will operate and we have um, administrative scopes and user scopes which define how a user, what a user is allowed to do, what administrators are allowed to do. Um, we have authentication and authorization scope which define how privacy idea behaves during authentication request and we have enrollment scopes which define how uh, tokens are enrolled and um, how the web UI operates and I think there are some other less important scopes too. And all these policies, or using these policies, we can actually um, also define roles. As I said, help desk users, administrators, operators. All policies have conditions so that you can very fine-grained um, define or differentiate certain conditions that the system behaves differently in a different condition. As I said, uh, lazy is my second given name. Um, this is why we have event handlers. And this, this is a very cool thing to, to automate tasks. Um, in really big scenarios, Imagine a university who, who gets uh, 5,000 new users every half a year. Uh, you don't want to do anything manually then. So things have to work automatically. Um, with the event handler we can um, link additional actions to any REST API request. So for example, enrolling a token is a REST API request. And then we can define these event handlers and say, okay, again, under certain conditions, for example, the condition is that an administrator enrolls a token, um, we activate uh, the user notification handler, which then would notify the user that the administrator, na na na, um, enrolled a token for the user. And then the user would receive an email, hey, the administrator enrolled a token. The interesting thing is that the administrator might be a help desk user who is basically allowed to enroll a token, but who is not allowed to modify the event handler definition. So 
a help desk user might have the right to start a process, but he is not allowed to modify the process. And so to, for full flexibility, we have a long list of uh, handlers. We also have a token handler where we can explicitly change the token or we can create new tokens. Um, we have uh, uh, handlers that can mangle the requests and the response. And if this is all not enough, we have an evil script handler which actually can uh, start a shell script or a Python script on the system and there you can basically do everything you want. Yeah, then we also have recurring tasks. These are kind of cron jobs within privacy idea and um, these are basically used to create statistics. So we can count certain events, for example, failed authentication requests or successful authentication requests or tokens enrolled by administrator John. Yeah? And we can count this event and then we can uh, accumulate the occurrences of these events and we can generate statistics and uh, then you can have nice colorful graphs in your Grafana or wherever you, whatever you are using there. Yeah, and then, as I said, we need plugins because who would want to install privacy idea just out of fun? Yeah, okay. During the last days, I learned we really have a cool UI. So, um, however, nevertheless, you, you wouldn't install privacy idea because you want to see the, the UI, you want to secure some access, and for this, you need plugins. Um, all plugins um, communicate to privacy idea via the REST API, interesting enough, there are also community-based plugins, but um, the most plugins are actually developed by the Privacy Idea team itself. And we have plugins for OwnCloud, I do not know if you know OwnCloud, it's the predecessor of Nextcloud. We have a plugin, of course, for free radius, where we can secure all VPNs and switches and whatever network components. And luckily, more important now, we have plugins for identity provider to web single sign-on. We have plugins for Keycloak, for simple SAML PHP, PHP for um, Shibboleth, for Glue, for, sorry, Microsoft Active Directory Federation service. And we also have components to allow the local log into Windows machines, Windows clients, Windows terminal servers. For this, we have the Privacy Idea credential provider, and we also have a Privacy Idea PUM module to um, allow the authentication to Linux machines. Um, all the plugins have the basically same functionality, which means you can secure your, you do not need to use uh, Google Authenticator LePUM anymore, because then you would be restricted to a second factor with a Google Authenticator or another smartphone app. Hey, you can now use Privacy Idea with a Privacy Idea PUM module because then you can use your WebAuthn token, uh, your FIDO2 token to log into your Linux machine. Centrally managed. Okay, this is probably the most complex setup, but it works. And Last but not least, um, we now also have a Privacy Idea Authenticator app which integrates quite nicely with Privacy Idea, which has a secure enrollment feature, um, which supports TOTP, HOTP, a push functionality, and this marvelous day password token. Um, it also has some, some aspects like in the um, centrally in the Privacy Idea server, you can define an enrollment policy and say, hey, if you enroll a, um, a smartphone app, please secure the app with the system settings. System settings. This means it depends on your smartphone. 
you scan the QR code and in the privacy idea authenticator, and then the privacy idea authenticator say, it says, hey, wait to see this TOTP value, you have to enter your PIN or you have to uh, provide your fingerprint or your face ID. This is the, the status quo. You can have it all. Now, not now, no, wait till I'm ready, but later. You can have it all later at no cost. But where are we actually going? Um, as you might have realized, we are, we are no cryptographers. We are not inventing new authentication protocols, algorithms whatsoever. We are the guys who try to make life easier and make this life available, easy life available to all who want it. So this is why we are doing open source. And um, we want to continue to automate tedious tasks. And we want to continue to stay open and flexible and transparent. The project is hosted at GitHub and uh, we most probably will continue to stay open and transparent because uh, technically it's probably not possible to ever change the license, the AGPL license under which the project was published. I come to it later. <clears throat> From a technical vision, we have really discrete ideas, distinct ideas. These are all publicly available on GitHub. You could also join the discussion. Um, we are planning to have nested token classes. Who of you knows the YubiKey? Yeah, thank you. And you know you can use the YubiKey as an HOTP token. You can use the YubiKey as a WebAuthn token. You can uh, install X509 certificates to the YubiKey. You can manage your SSH keys on the YubiKey. By the way, you can do this all with privacy idea. For privacy idea currently, these are four authentication objects. And the plan is that we can nest these or container these into a, a logical unit. Because what will happen a user will call the help desk and will say, I lost my YubiKey. The user will probably not say, hey, I lost my HOTP token and my X509 certificate, I lost my SSH keys and also my WebAuthn token. So again, this is an idea to make life easier, to make this, it more manageable, to, uh, to automate processes better. Um, then we have the idea of pre-authentication, which basically means um, before a plugin will try to authenticate a user against privacy idea, the plugin will communicate with privacy idea and ask, hey, or it will say, hey, um, I'm currently located in Pasadena. It is, uh, I don't know, uh, 72 degrees out here. Uh, what should I do? Then privacy idea will say, oh, all right, I know the situation. Please ask the user for a WebAuthn token. Okay, this example is maybe a bit unrealistic, but this is basically the idea to, to pass somehow the context in which the user is, in which the application is, and so that we can decide how we are requiring to authenticate the user. Yeah, then we also have the idea to add new authentication flows, for example, authentication without a username. Um, you might know this from FIDO2, WebAuthn, in, with uh, resident keys. <coughs> but there are also other interesting aspects. Uh, you could also present the user a QR code you have no information of the user. You simply present a QR code which contains a challenge. You could scan the QR code and you could answer the challenge together with your username and then you could log in the user. So we always try to find a generic aspect like 
authenticating without username and see, okay, what, what scenarios actually uh, fall together here. Yeah, and our philosophical vision is we want privacy idea to mm, somehow be a de facto standard of open source authentication. Um, and we also want privacy idea to be open source and to be usable um, by all people. And we like people to understand what they are doing. It hurts to offer a black box. It hurts if, if someone does not have the possibility to understand why he's doing th something or how it works. So this is very important to us so that uh, people using privacy idea can understand what they are doing there. But how can we achieve this? Okay, um, step one is we are able to develop privacy idea, which means um, we generated money, we, we founded a company, we can work on privacy idea, we can still provide it as open source. Um, and this is also something interesting if you are into developing open source software. I think if you find your niche and your niche product, you can very well make a relaxed living out of open source. Go out, do it. The second step to achieve is um, we need to increase the user base. This is an ongoing process. <coughs> However, uh, oh, yeah, the user base is difficult to measure. Maybe the best measurement would be to walk through downtown and ask a, a passing guy, hey, do you know privacy idea? Hmm. Um, we want to increase the, the user base. We cannot measure it because we are always struggling and thinking, no, we do not want to implement any calling home functionality in the, in, the, in, the, in the software. We also do not know who downloads privacy idea. Um, you can install privacy idea from the Python package index. We do not have any control over the Python package index. Um, yeah, phew, we have 1,400 stars on uh, GitHub and uh, roughly 1,000 users in the community forum. When we come back next year, Maybe I can tell you a different number, but it's difficult to measure. Um, yeah, how can we increase the user base? Yeah, it's quite clearly uh, go to scale and talk about it. Um, I will check tomorrow. Step four would be um, improve the, not the user base, but the developer base. and. This is really a difficult thing, but I think this is also, for me, it's an important thing because if you can say, hey, I have an open source project here and it is not only used by a lot of people, but it is also understood by a lot of people who are contributing to the project. So we have in the GitHub repository, we have a file contributing.md where everyone can read how to contribute. Um, we also have roughly 100 contributors um, of which only 10 people ever get paid. So there must be 90 contributors who contributed out of their personal need. Um, unfortunately, these contributors only contributed a few lines of code. Um, the whole software has 35,000 lines of code and um, by these 90 contributors, or these 90 contributors only contributed less than 8,000 lines of code. Yeah, step five, how to achieve this, or step five would be um, privacy idea can live by itself. It can walk by itself. It is maybe a bit like with your kids. 
Yeah, you need to foster them, you need to take care of them, you have to push them, you have to work on them, but maybe one day they can leave home and they can exist on their own. I talked a lot about our next steps. So your next steps are now stay in control. Originally, I had in this presentation, stay on prem. Uh, I, I understand that this is a bit uh, mm, irritating here. For me, on-prem means this is my system, no matter where it is located. It does not have to be in my basement, in my office. So stay in control. Even if you uh, book a server at AWS and install privacy idea there. I think it's better than booking a cloud service you don't have under your control. Use privacy idea. Go to the privacyidea.org website. You can find anything there. You can find links to the documentation. Um, you can find links to the community uh, forum under community.privacyidea.org. You can contribute if you dived deeper into it at GitHub. And your next step very closely is uh, talk to us. Um, we also has a, have a booth here in the exhibition hall, number 202. And this is all I wanted to say to you today. So thank you for your patience, for your interest. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer, answer these. Thanks. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I might have missed that one. What did you say when, what if you lose your YubiKey? What was the, I didn't understand the point you were making. Was it under like something like nested token class when you're talking about YubiKey or was it something else? This was an example for the nested token class. You can use your YubiKey uh -huh. today. Um, yes. You can initialize it yes. so that it works as an HOTP token by pressing the knob, then it emits right. the HOTP value, or wait, we also support this YubiKey mechanism, this AES encrypted long string is also supported by privacy idea. We have um, components that you can enroll a certificate onto the YubiKey, so you could use it as a smart card with a okay. X509 certificate. And you can use it as a web auth end token, but these are all, for privacy idea currently, these are all different tokens, four tokens, but and they are not clustered yeah, currently. Oh, so this is for future open ideas, right? The, the one that you're working uh, on. Yeah, clustering these existing functionality is a future idea. Okay, so I guess I'm lost. So what if you don't, you lose your EBK? Do you go to that QR code thing that you talk about or what? What if you lose that? This is a very interesting question. This is what we usually discuss with our customers or in the forum because there are a lot of possibilities what you do and it depends on you what you want to do. Um, okay. Privacy idea is a management system. So it is managed. If a user loses his YubiKey, mm -hmm. you can decide how you implement your processes, what should happen then? Oh. You, you can decide, do you provide some kind of self-service portal where the user goes and says, hey, I lost my YubiKey. Um, shall he uh, call the help desk? And we have a functionality of um, a lost token functionality where you get a static code, which is valid for maybe the next two or seven days. Mm. Um, the user could go and enroll a new token directly. You could provide a backup token right from the start. Mm -hmm. So everyone handles this a bit different. And this is what we want to do. We want to give you possibilities. We want to give you options. Yeah. I like that, different options. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for the question. Oh, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question for the recording, okay. Oh, it's okay, yeah. 
Uh, I noticed uh, you have an enterprise edition of Privacy Idea. What is the difference, um, or is it is it the same product? Okay, the question was, he noticed uh, we have an enterprise edition. Maybe he got a sneak preview on, on the website. Um, it is basically the same code. Um, what we as a company sell as an, uh, ent as an enterprise edition is the same code with, um, with uh, support, with a different repository. Um, for example, also the RPM package is contained in this enterprise edition. Um, the, the Debian packages, uh, for example, in the enterprise edition, we release them later. So we are currently working on version 3.10, uh, and this will be released in the community repositories, and the enterprise repository will only get version 3.10.1. So that enterprise customers uh, would install a more stable version. On the other hand, if you're running the community uh, version, which is the same code, you can also decide for yourself, no, I will not update to version 3.10. I will wait for version 3.10.1. So it's the same. OK, no further question. So thanks again, and have a great day, and maybe